Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to our audience from around the world. Uh, a very warm wel welcome on behalf of the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures at the University of Virginia. I'm Devjani Ganguly, the director of the Institute, uh, and I have great pleasure in hosting our distinguished speaker, Professor Patricia Hayes from the University of Western Cape this morning. I also have the pleasure of introducing the convener of today's event, uh, our Mellon Global South faculty fellow, Julia Paolotti. None of this would happen without Julia's amazing uh, energy and vision. So thanks to Julia. Um, so for those of you around the world, the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures has uh, been hosting uh, a Mellon funded humanities fellows program uh, these past five years as part of a broad multi-year initiative on the Global South, an agenda for advanced research and curricular innovation in the humanities. Apart from working on their research projects, our Mellon Fellows offer public lectures, workshops, and mentoring to graduate students at the Institute. So before I turn things over to Julia, let me say a few words about her amazing accomplishments. Julia Paolotti is Assistant Professor of African Art in the Department of Art and Art History here at UVA. A specialist in African photography and African art more broadly, Julia has extensive curatorial experience, most notably as the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her 2015 exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum, In and Out of the Studio, Photographic Portraits from West Africa presented 100 years of portrait photography in West Africa. The exhibition overlapped with her doctoral work at Columbia University, which focused on the history of photography in Senegal from 1860 to 1960. Approaching the medium from a variety of angles, from the historical to the contemporary, from Sufi Islamic to secular portraiture, and from medium specificity to intermediality. Her work has appeared in various edited volumes and academic journals, including the Metropolitan Museum Journal, Tribal Arts, and African Arts. Julia's research has been supported by awards and fellowships from the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Before moving to the University of Virginia, uh, she taught at Barnard College and the Pratt Institute. I now invite Julia to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Patricia Hayes from the University of Western Cape. Thank you, Devjani, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, we're so thrilled to have you all here and to have this lecture that was supposed to happen two years ago and it's happening now and we're so happy that it is happening. So um, thank you all very much. So um, Patricia Hayes is the NRF Sachi Chair in Visual History and Theory at the Center for Humanities Research at the University of Western uh, Cape, South Africa. A scholar of African history, gender studies, and visuality, Professor Hayes began research on photography and the question of history after completing her PhD at the University of Cambridge. Initially conceived through an exhibition project on Namibia called The Colonizing Camera, the research and teaching project in visual history was established. Her research and teaching converge around issues of visuality, African history, and the archive as a method. In fact, Professor Hayes is part of a movement to promote the preservation and activation of archives, where the archive also becomes part of the methodological and philosophical thinking. She's currently developing a project on new thematics for anti-apartheid photographs, provisionally called interpenetrations. Professor Hayes has, has published extensively with essays that have appeared in journals such as Photographies, Cultural Critique, and the Public Sphere, sphere from Outside the West. Um, also, she contributed to edited volume and exhibition catalogs such as Oqui Enwazor's The Rise and Fall of Apartheid, The South African Reader, and Santo Mofokeng Chasing Shadows. <clears throat> 
She has served as editor for um, several journal special issues, including Gender and History and Chronos. And as such, her contribution to the field of photography and more specifically, the history of the medium in Southern Africa cannot be overstated. Her essays on seminal figures such as South African photographers, Santo Mofoking, David Goldblatt, Joe Ratcliffe, Omar Bacha, as well as Ricardo Rangel and Koknam of Mozambique have been foundational to the understanding and critique of the category of the documentary in apartheid and post-apartheid South Africa. Her most recent co-edited volume, Ambivalent Photography and Visibility in African History, offers yet another critical contribution to the understanding of the medium. In using what she calls an ambivalent framing, a concept she adapts from Santo Mufoking and Sigmund Freud, the volume explores the medium irreconcilable extremes, conscious and unconscious, transparency and opacity, light and non-light, resistance and repression. As such, the volume pushes for a rereading of images whose seeming familiarity and legibility have limited our ability to interpret them. She's demanding that we look harder and engage in new kind of conversation. In giving precedence to African own history of light, ambivalent not only account for the continent specific histories of photography, which predate and exceed any European intentionality, but ambivalent rethinks what photography is and what it does. In her contribution, Hayes has the invaluable ability to rest in that opacity and instability without ever compromising a determination to address and redress histories of violence documented and perpetrated through the camera. So without further ado, I um, let Patricia speak. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia, for this really generous introduction. And um, I'm, I'm very honored to be invited to um, give this lecture. Thank you. Um, I should perhaps mention that I initially started preparing this um, presentation as a paper in response to a special issue of the journal called History in Africa, uh, where they were seeking papers on new methodologies and sources, as they called it. Um, the audience I had in mind when I started writing this uh, was the sort of historian, historians of Africa. And this will probably explain some of the more obvious ground that I'm going to cover today. Uh, so just to say to those art historians and other more theoretically oriented scholars to please bear with me. Um, my intention here is to probe whether new modes of reading photographs might be able to connect us in unexpectedly rich ways with Africa's more distant past. And my starting point is the lapse in efforts to reconstruct earlier histories in sub-Saharan Africa initially triggered in the 1960s. That impetus left behind a distinguished but much debated field, especially in the study of oral history and tradition. As research on tradition has tapered off, so has productivity around what has been termed the pre-colonial. Pre in fact, what we call the source the oral appears to be overlapping and almost consonant with the periodization pre-colonial, as if both are clear cut. This hiatus has added to expressions of a general sense of difficulty around the historical record for Africa's earlier eras. And the default explanation keeps coming back to the relative lack of written archives. When disciplines such as political science, history, and interdisciplinary areas like development studies tend to focus on histories of colonial, of colonial and post-colonial Africa, questions of the more distant historical epochs are increasingly left by the wayside. As Richard Reed has noted, this results in a foreshortening of centuries of history and an expansion of the more recent past. 
And now as debates intensify around imperial plunder, decolonization and post-colonial restitution, there is even more impetus to remain focused on the colonial. My concern is that we are in danger of being left with little else but the colonial. So this is why I put the question, is it possible to steal time from the scenario? Can we buck time? And can photographs help us to do so? Can we especially steal time from those antechambers of history, those threshold spaces in Africa that saw a longer inception of colonialism and whose minutiae have been documented and remembered in particular ways? The growing literature on photography in sub-Saharan Africa has also focused overwhelmingly on colonial and post-colonial periods, with the camera often conceived as a tool of empire that came with European contact from the second half of the 19th century. Now, of course, this research has wonderfully expanded our understandings, especially of the 20th century, the nuances of changing urban subjectivities through studio photography, for example, as well as analysis of colonial and nationalist projections of modernization and development. It's also enabled new insights into the making of social exclusions, the malcontents and the dissonances and contradictions within these grander narratives. But as the critical work around photographs continues to grow, I wish to ask whether the methodological possibilities of accessing a more distant African past through this medium are also within reach? And if so, how? Now, the point is not that photos do wondrous things in themselves, but they have a capacity to ask questions and to sometimes demand new relationships between multiple existing materials from the past and what these respectively and collectively afford, which might help us to come at things from new angles. Those materials that originate from actual situations and milieu, such as written documents and photographic images, lend historians the possibility of great degrees of precision in summoning up the past. Of course, they are produced through distinctive forms of inscription and photographs are very much, I quote, differently figured accounts of the subject matter as Elizabeth Edwards phrases it in her new book, Photographs and the Practice of History. But in distinguishing between different kinds of record, historians often treat them as separate and discrete when they might have been co-produced within the same milieu and reference very similar things, albeit in different registers. These concurrencies and inflections might have implications that only emerge when all accounts are considered together. During my own research on Southern Africa, for example, I've noticed how, you know, earlier in the 20th century, people attending a scene and prior to writing their reports often did a kind of visual note taking with their cameras, recording very different things that did not necessarily appear in re reports or which elderly spokesmen might not reference when later embarking on oral accounts of what was going on. Not for nothing did Siegfried Krakauer refer to photographs as a first draft of history. Matters permeate be between things, sometimes overlapping, sometimes not. On its side, the camera records whatever is in front of it with what Sikula called metrical accuracy. But as Michel Friseau puts it, a photographic image is at the intersection of the physicometric, a data recording system of a quantity of photons, and the biometric, the culture influence system of human perception. We only have the image with its spatial and temporal attestation inscribed in what Friseau calls a universal chronology to try to make sense of what was there. Now, other kinds of recording or retelling, whether written or oral, 
have temporal lapses, however slight, that might filter out what is deemed unimportant or irrelevant. Georges de Die Huberman suggests with reference to the Warsaw Ghetto that photographs offer a uniquely potent medium that bridges the gulf, I quote, between contact and distance. This is even as they have their limits, which historians often perceive to be greater than they are. According to Edwards, the nervousness of historians around photos arises because photos offer, I quote, little historical closure, they are radically open-ended and never fully resolved, end of quote. But in Edwards' view, these features are highly productive. Once these anxieties are acknowledged, the entire engagement with photographs makes such disciplinary practices more self-revealing. I agree with Edwards here that it is not simply about retrieval of the past, though it is of course about that. We are also forced to confront some of the unacknowledged and debatable practices of history itself. Most historical practice entails a double operation. On the one hand, historians rely on what is insistently referred to as evidence, which is a legal category connected to provability and traceability with footnotes and references to indicate from where the originating points have come. And such standards of evidence are often adverse for African history. On the other hand, historians also claim to reconstruct the past through their own selection and narrative organization of the materials with which they work. But in fact, it is impossible to reconstruct what we do not know and have not lived through. Did it really happen like this? To quote Il Corunia on ontological drift, historical reality is incomparably more absent and incomparably more inaccessible than we like to think. Thus, the constructed nature of all historical writing. This is even as such writing draws on what it calls sources that originate from real situations and milieu and which lend such processes of construction their possibility of approximating any accuracy. Edwards aptly refers to, I quote, tensions and double partialities of history as construction and history as search for objective fact and explanation. In her view, photographs exemplify these tensions. And as Jennifer Tucker has argued, I quote, by exposing the questions we ought to raise about all historical evidence, Photographs reveal not simply the potential and limits of photography as a historical source, but the potential and limits of all historical sources and historical inquiry as an intellectual project. Now, such arguments create more of a level ground between the different media that retain traces of the past. But for historians to do justice to photographs and realize this alluring potential, and at risk of going over much well-covered ground, we need to acknowledge certain other things that photographs have in common with other sources when it comes to the writing of African history. And first, any so-called source, whether visual, textual, oral, sonic, is not a fount <laughs> representing some origin of knowledge, despite the name source. It's always already an interpretation. In both content and form, however, it often yields something in excess of the intentions of its maker. Second, these sources cannot be treated as pure and hermetically sealed entities. To a certain degree, as suggested earlier, there can be interpenetration and citation across different media over time whether oral, written, or visual. They often spill over, relay each other, and reference much the same thing. Thirdly, 
And as a result of this, materials that carry such historical traces do not necessarily respect the rigid periodizations that historians have imposed. And I just want to move to some um, images, so I'm hoping everybody can see the screen. Here, therefore, I wish to emphasize the in interpenetration of sources and the durability of things surfacing in photographs that come from the more distant past. Periods of early encounter and initiation of colonial rule are especially dense in this regard. To date, these multiple and overlapping presences have tended to be treated as overwhelmingly colonial and going in a certain inevitable direction. The matter is conceived as inaugurating the end of the pre-colonial. The either or terminology of periodization, pre-colonial slash colonial confines us to a linear conception of time, which shuts down other possibilities. But is this simply a problem of periodization? In his work on the microspatial, De Vito looks at the uh, what he calls the traditional divisions of history and insists that periodizations such as pre-modern and modern are no more than, I quote, visible legacies of the Eurocentric approach. To a glaring degree, this applies to the terms colonial and pre-colonial. We need to move beyond these predefined periodizations, as De Vito argues, and towards pertinent and even, as he puts it, ad hoc periodizations embedded in the research process. Now, all of this implies rethink, not just rethinking, but actually unthinking colonialism, and especially its pre-phase. It means undoing their pre-definition, which actually constitute planes of history, to borrow um, Reinhard Koselleck's um, concept. Now this, this uh, lecture will concentrate on a few photographic images from the Kuvalai floodplain located in what is now southern Angola and northern Namibia. By the early part of the 20th century, this was a contested region between Portugal, Germany, and several sizable local polities and African kingdoms. And if you can see my cursor, I'm pointing to the area that uh, we will be looking at today called Kwamatu on this map. And this is the area claimed by Portugal. Um, now, the first photograph that I want to think about um, originates from a photo album of the Portuguese officer Veloso de Castro who participated in the 1907 military campaign against Kwamatu, but which is known locally as Ombanja. This 1907 campaign, and this is very important, was to avenge an earlier expedition in 1904 that ended in catastrophic defeat and many fatalities at a site called Pembe. Given what Edwards calls the micro levels at which we encounter the past, and I'm quoting her there, um, through photographs, as well as the foreshortening of history that occurs by not taking the pre-colonial seriously, can such photos help us to think about time differently and expand our spatial sense of these deeper pasts? One of the figures to emerge from the pages of this 1907 photo album of the Portuguese military expedition to conquer and occupy Kwamatu is a young fighter referred to as uh, Soldado Kwamatu or Kwamatu, Kwamatu soldier in translation in the caption in the album and elsewhere. Now a slight figure uh, he was standing with his wrists draped over the long barrel of a rifle on his shoulders when he was photographed. His portrait is not only in the album, but also in Veloso de Castro's published war memoir, um, both inside the book and 
on the back cover. The memoir and album both detail a grueling ex expedition and campaign. There is some elaboration in the memoir around a particular young Komatu soldier with a Snyder rifle, whom I believe to be the man in this portrait. Specifically, Veloso de Castro's account has this figure as one of a number of young fighters who appeared with their weapons in a place called Naluek after the successful Portuguese occupation. Um, and they sort of hung around mistrustfully. As the campaign ended, the soldier joined Veloso's small column on its return to the Portuguese fort at Humbe, where in fact he was arrested. When the main expedition arrived back in Humbe, this um, Kwamato soldier was set free. Veloso de Castro remarks in his memoir how odd it was that, I quote, having been convinced he would die at our hands, he showed not the slightest gratitude or sign of admiration for our gesture. End of quote. So instead, the narrator saw a sovereign indifference. Fascinating how this apparently simple photo brings us immediately into a crowded historiography and can be inserted into a range of accounts and multiple archives. But this is not just an empirical thickening, what happened, the causal links, etc. It might also be the moment when new questions and thematics emerge. So first, some basic questions. How does the photo come to exist? As in many other colonial settings, the camera was part of expeditionary equipment. A career soldier, Veloso de Castro seems to have had considerable experience in Angola, achieving high technical standards and considerable output. In fact, it was his photographic work that caused the governor of Angola to invite him to publish his war memoir. Now, he actually made two portraits of the Kwamatu soldier. Uh, as you can see here below, um, the, the caption, Kwamatu prisoner um, in Aluende. So while he made the two portraits, uh, he repeatedly published the one. Sorry, let me just wait. Perhaps it was the subject's quality of aloofness while being present that offered something distinctive enough to draw Veloso de Castro to portray him with his camera in the first place. It might be a symptom of the insecurity arising from the seesaw of history for the Portuguese here, from crushing defeat in 1904 to victory in 1907 and a compulsive interest in an enemy, the Kwamatu, who had inflicted so much damage a few years earlier, but who had fought, capitulated, and were now leaderless. Now, interestingly, Kwamatu soldier has more visual prominence than the expedition guide, whose name was Kali Palula, who is now the subject of a film called A Story from Africa by Billy Woodbury. Both Kwamatu soldier and Woodbury's search for the subjectivity of this guide uh, named Kali Palula, who was offered a chiefship by the Portuguese and tried to commit suicide, they represent large zones of unknowability. The photographic record shows attention to the soldier's dress and accoutrement as soldier, which Veloso de Castro also describes in considerable detail in his memoir. They were his ammunition bits carried on his person, not very safely, it was said, and amulets. But he also wore two mecanismos de relogio, or timepieces, which he informed the Portuguese he had collected in 1904 from Pembe. Pembe, as mentioned, was where over 300 members of the previous Portuguese expedition had perished in 1904. That particular expedition had been on its way to invade and occupy the largest kingdom in the region, 
called Okwanyama, but it was ambushed and completely annihilated by the little known neighboring Kwamatu forces. Both Kwamatu and Kwanyama were on the border between territories claimed by Germany and Portugal, though the bigger part of their lands were in Angola. The 1907 expedition was in fact to avenge this devastating and disgraceful defeat at the hands of a tiny African army. According to Veloso de Castro, it was an indelible and pungent memory. 1907, its objective was to effect a more substantial presence near the putative colonial border that only existed in theory and hypothetically on maps and whose exact latitude was moreover disputed between Germany and Portugal. And this expedition of 1907 um, only had Kwamatu in its sights, stopping well short of trying to occupy the larger kingdom of Okwanyama. Uh, this is a photograph that appears in the memoir by Veloso de Castro, which is the uh, human remains of the victims of 1904 after they had been gathered together because they were taken away for proper burial. And I'm, the maps I'm showing you come from a publication called The South of Angola, later published uh, by um, the uh, governor, Joao de Almeida. Uh, this is a map of the, pro the process through Kwamatu in 1907. And this is a wonderful map that also appears in um, the South of Angola uh, publication, which shows after uh, 1907, it's now 1910. There's one area here you can see Kwanyama, and it's called the, 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 the disobedient territories, while the others are occupied. Now the soldier incorporated the two timepieces on his person along with his other accoutrements. Besides lifting these and other objects such as straps, water bottles, rifles, and ammunition from the battlefield at Pembe, he and his comrades had stolen time from the Portuguese. One might even say that in stealing time from colonialism, they disrupted its forceful teleology and pushed back the progress of conquest, obliging the Portuguese to take some years to rebuild the impetus to return again with greater force and lesser ambition. And one picks up on the discomfort of Portuguese commentators at the hints of surprising parity, their unease at hints of equivalence, at the uncertainty of poss possible outcomes to their venture. It should also remind us of the existence of other concepts of time. In the camera as historian, which charts the British survey movement of the late 19th and 20th century, Elizabeth Edwards argues that I quote, temporal interjections of photography merge with layers of deep time. This is also apt for Angola, but in a quite specific way. Almost everyone is familiar with the concept of the optical unconscious that Benjamin proposed in relation to the unexpected visibilities that the space of the photograph might yield. But in relation to African history, I've been trying to work with another concept of the unconscious in relation to photographs, a kind of historical unconscious, if you like. This works at two levels when it comes to picture taking in this epoch. At one level, it is the unnoticed, the contingent, the detail not, not observed, which later provides clues, however inconsequential. These often emerge in what Chris Morton calls the hinterlands of a photograph. At a second level, these inadvertent recordings are often accompanied and amplified by the unconscious or unthought way of the colonial officer or official looking at the subject behind the camera, for they might think they know what they see, but in fact, they don't. There's often considerable ignorance in their way of looking. It is often solipsistic, 
about their expedition to southern Angola in this case with some inclusions. For this army, as for other European armies in Africa, it is often a function of militarism, masculinity and whiteness. And this is an argument Matthias Heusler makes for the German Herrera war, just ending further south with genocidal results um, in what was then Southwest Africa. Now the Portuguese were largely illiterate in this landscape, but they brought their technological instrumentation to bear in the attempt to attain a sovereign gaze. Such temporal interjections merging with deep time, in fact, enable a degree of sovereign accident, producing an ambivalence which merges conscious and unconscious elements that might even be at odds. Kwamato soldier sets a number of issues into relief. Photography itself was conceived as a triumph against the corruption of time, superseding the loss of the moment. Edwards puts the issues in quite an intricate way. I quote, tracing, stilling, holding, bridging, even eliminating time, photographs and photography were part of modernity's management of time and its emerging historical consciousness. A uh, good question here is whether we are still trapped in this mode of historical consciousness. And I think non-contemporary photographs brought into the contemporary in new ways to unsettle other kinds of documentation might help to unravel this. This may seem counterintuitive given the camera was a tool of empire, but so was the gun with which Africans armed themselves in defense of their autonomy. Technology obviously plays both ways. In Southern Angola, photography was part of the larger infrastructure brought by the Portuguese that included the telegraph, the camera, and the timepiece itself. The watch or the timepiece was in itself an extension of the capacity to measure time that had become diffused across European cities by the early 20th century. This allowed its carrier, as Mary Ann Duane puts it, to be constantly in sight of time. These multiple components constitute not just infrastructure, but an infrastructure of time. We should include here the photo album of Veloso de Castro, which in it is in itself a highly sequenced structure that laid out the conquest of Kwamatu, with the expedition setting out from Humbe, fighting a number of tough engagements that took them through Mufilo, Al Congo, Makuve, Aikar, Damaker, Inyoka, Mogogo, and finally Naluek, and then returning to Humbe and the coast. As Marianne Hirsch and Leo Spitzer remind us in their book on liquid time, a photo album is supposed to show progressive linear time. In a special issue of History and Theory, edited by Tucker, Michael Roth analyzes the way time is segmented into even parts, which are also spatialized. This goes beyond simple notions of linear time into a glimmer of realization that chronology relies on equidistant parts, standardized parts that are in equilibrium. Edwards argues that photos do one kind of sabotage to this, which is to bring the distant past immediately closed without calibration of equidistant parts or segments of time. As she says, and I quote, a graspable reality in a play of closeness and distance. So by ripping the photo of the Kwamatu soldier out of the expedition album and asking other questions of it, uh, what happens? Now, this all started with my own analog photographing of certain photographs in the album of Veloso de Castro. This was in 1990 in Luanda, when there was no other means of making my own record. And I thank the Centro Nacional de Documenta Saui, Investigação Histórico, for allowing this. I felt compelled to do this, not because I was deeply interested 
in photographs at the time, it only became uh, a focus of um, interest and research later. Moreover, in Luanda, my tendency was to want to run away from military history, which is what this seemed to be. However, I photographed the pages because I became utterly fascinated by the sequence of water holes that were pictured in the album, uh, which, and it suddenly dawned on me when I was there, matched the accounts I had heard from an interview I was very privileged to have with a man called Ntwamoneni, which had happened a few months earlier. And he was a descendant of uh, one of the Kwamato kings. And the previous image you were seeing and the current image uh, are showing some of these documented waterholes. Now, Mtuamo Neni was a descendant of one of the Kwamato kings. And I'd been taken to interview him at a place called Okolongo, which is where the remnants of the Kwamato kingdoms had settled across the border inside Namibia during World War I. World War I is what locals called the Second War because it brought another wave of colonial occupation. Mtuamoneni had recounted the sequence of battles around a number of waterholes in the year 1907. I only realized their exactitude, their verbal and poetic precision when I came across this album and saw each one spatially reconstituted in a series of photographic frames pasted into the album. As research with Herero speaking groups in Namibia suggests, pastoralists tend to plot their oral poetics very precisely around seasonal water, watering places for their herds. And here, agro-pastoralist oral accounts from former Kwamatu plotted the loss of their kingdom around waterholes they were stable and linked points of memory to counter the threat of extinction and forgetting. To borrow the phrasing of Didi Huberman, the names of waterholes surge up like violent spots of memory that also work as diegetic elements in a history that's chronologically articulated. And Veloso de Castro kindly documented it with the expedition camera for completely other purposes, all of which shouted out loud that Mtuamoneni was right. His account was spot on. But actually, what do we have here in this repeating image of the Kwamatu soldier? The photograph focuses our attention. In itself, it does not narrate. This form of limit is what Didi Huberman conceives as having an important lacunary function, pushing us to mobilize other resources touching on the matter. The subject, the soldado himself, is referred to in a textual narrative stemming from the same milieu. He is not mentioned in person in any oral narratives, but his theft of time from the Portuguese is a point that takes us directly to another aspect of oral history from the region, which perhaps we should be more bold about and call black thought. While Portugal was in a race against Germany for the control of Southern Angola, the textual narrative of the African lifting of Portuguese timekeeping should alert us to another completely different concept of time that was rooted deeply in this remarkable floodplain environment. And this was a philosophy of allowing things to come to fullness instead of an extractive measured sense of time. In 1904, time had changed hands. The timepieces which had measured the beat of a prior expedition that met with catastrophe, I'm sorry, I'm need to go back to this previous image. The timepieces which had measured the beat of a prior expedition that met with catastrophe was then born in 1907 by a dauntless young man like an amulet, consuming the machinic substance, the casings, the trappings of the colonizer, and stilling its beat. This was ironic because the timepiece which allowed its carrier to be constantly in sight of time was the emblem 
and prosthetic of a concept of time that was most famously denounced by the incoming Kwanyama king, Mandume Yande Mufayo. The new king's view was, however, part of a generalized commons, an oral knowledge commons, which held that you did not push things prematurely. You did not do things out of self-interest, but in the interests of the larger community who needed to eat those things that only ripen in the fullness of time. In the metaphor of eating unripe fruits, jumping ahead was regarded as greed that put different parties at risk. German missionaries in the Kwanyama kingdom since the 1890s mention this widely held tenet, but it has con congealed very specifically in the oral histories around Mandume, who appears in this group photograph here with South African officials in 1915. And Mandume is uh, the figure who is seated there uh, with his hands on one of his hunting dogs. The most detailed elaboration of the oral history around Mandume was offered by the late Reverend Wilho Kaulinge. And in this account, um, when he came to power in 1911, Mandume set out a number of new laws as part of a policy of internal reno renovation that drew on very deep precedents. The first of his laws was a prohibition on the harvesting of unripe fruits, especially from Omwandi trees, whose fruit had been increasingly beaten off prematurely during recent droughts. Subjects were under an injunction to respect the process of ripening, to respect the fullness of time, not its speeding up and rearrangement for acquisitive and what the king deemed socially destructive purposes. Europeans had different ways of managing time. And just to recall how Edwards has put it, I quote, tracing, stilling, holding, bridging, even eliminating time. Such hubris is ultimately constitutive of what we're now calling the Anthropocene. Waiting for the fruits to turn is not. Inaugurated as the king of Okwanyama in 1911, Mandume's new laws were explicitly phrased by the historian Kaulinge as an undoing of the things his profligate royal uncles had done and permitted before. He wanted to turn the tide to push back time. Because Mandume additionally put the brakes on uh, offenses like random firing of guns, conducting raids without his sanction, this recentralization of power also represents a form of managing time. It signals too that groups were for, for long already deeply immersed in negotiating a threshold with the agents and artifacts of merchant capital. But as I hope is apparent, my point here is not to find a pristine pre-colonial, but rather connected singularities. So the attempt here is to write with a sense of such overlappings and thresholds in ways that carry the different skeins of plural actors and actants. The problem with big terms like colonial is that they make it harder to apprehend plural and minor historical presences, except in rather dichotomized terms. Their predefined parameters tend to work across what De Vito calls, I quote, spaces considered as internally homogeneous and mutually isolated. Now, the beautiful point about Southern Angola and the floodplain region is that it is none of these things, but has a more liquid quality, as it were with larger and smaller tides of movement, where, as Subramanyam puts it, I quote, historical processes develop at the crossroads of multiple local and regional interactions. The invocation or law not to shake or knock the unripe fruit off the Omwandi tree until the fruit has ripened and can benefit the many signals a way of being in and with the world that is non-extractive. <laughs> 
and I'm using here the phrasing of uh, John Rico. It is controlled in such a way that it enhances future survival. People here had to think about biodiversity and ends because disaster of ecological proportions might not be far off. This is all rather haunting when one takes a look at the more recent war for Namibian independence, where the South African Defense Force instituted a 10 kilometer wide scorched earth zone along the entire border between Namibia and Angola. Now this earlier ecological way of being in the world tilts us into a cosmos of African thought that historically stretched across many parts of the continent. Agricultural peoples regularly mark the importance of such a principle in major ceremonies often called in English the first fruits, where newly harvested food was brought into a center and ritual um, thanksgiving offered. In major centralized powers such as Asante and in Southern Africa, Zulu, Swazi and other Nguni kingdoms, travelers and officials commented on the spectacular proportions these ceremonies could reach. They also sketched, printed and photographed them extensively. These might be cases again where colonialists know not what they photographed, producing fractured portrayals of quite another infrastructure of time. The invocation of the figure of Mandume in oral accounts that is a form of witnessing that is not ocular, but auricular, is where the most detail emerges regarding his internal policies from 1911. But there is a cluster of documentation around his period of rule and its end. At the time of the, um, the making of the Kwamatu album in 1907, missionary accounts inform us Mandume was still being sheltered from his uncles by his great aunt Nekoto, um, the, the then king of Kwanyama, where Yulu Yahedimbi had signed a treaty allowing mineral exploration and extraction in the kingdom. Portuguese accounts record the undertaking by his successor, King Nande Yahedimbi, not to interfere in Kwamatu when the expedition attacked. Nande in turn signed an agreement with the Germans in 1908. These are the delicate turns of negotiated peace and what we might call the antechamber of colonialism, but where antechamber does not have to signify a teleology. Here, thinking of Mandune, the spatial notion of an antechamber rather than a temporal notion is useful because it means you hear the noise and vibration of the conquest of your neighbors as if through a thin dividing wall and it prepares you it galvanizes your existing resources that long inception allows us to apprehend some of the more articulated patterns of multiple and combined temporalities now at the time, photos were not in the common world of the people in southern Angola here. We are using them later to, as it were, look around the corner of history. Or following Runia's work on presence, the photo of a soldier who took timepieces to wear with his amulets works like a metonym taken from one context to another and slightly out of place becoming, I quote, a fistula or hole through which the past discharges into the present. Here we have the contemporaneity of the non-contemporary letting in African thought. As mentioned earlier, the issue of time in the oral accounts I refer to is not just held in a singular text like that of Kaulinge. The value according, accorded to time where ripeness is all was also much more widely disseminated. David Cohen has remarked that we might usefully see such historical knowledge as, I quote, fully engaged with broader social intelligence, known, experienced, and manipulated 
of which he says historians redactions of testimonies are narrow selected privileged pieces. Writing, uh, this is already from two decades ago, Cohen argues for the power of stories to be evaluated, I quote, by their play and effect in the past and in the present, instead of being extracted, and I quote, reduced into history by the methods of the new African historiography. Now, he was writing at a time when there was an internal critique of the, um, the work on oral history and oral tradition. It seems to me that the different ways um, this photograph of a Kwamatu soldier, the different ways that has time encoded in it, resuscitates what has become an entire undercommons. The metaphor of the unripe fruits is at play, an undercommons still being referred to in 2017 at the centenary memorial for Mandume. And the photo of the Kwamatu soldier draws our attention to this, not because it narrates this as such, but because the act of taking it signals something deeper and wider is going on in a colonial blind spot. It's just conceivable that buried within the photo, compacted into the hybrid accoutrement worn on the soldier's body is an African re refutation of universal measurable notions of empty time. But even if we don't accept that African notions of time imprinted in the image uh, are imprinted in the image, what, what the photo of the Kwamatu soldier does do is push us against a limit that forces us to ask more thematic and even abstract questions that bring the unquestioned assumptions of historical practice into focus. And perhaps this is what Edward suggests when she says that photos can work to put pressure on historical thinking. There are deeper networks of connections between materials from the past from which we need to draw deeply and not necessarily arrange chronologically like a timepiece, but assemble alongside interspersed and collaged with each other. Um, the historian of the Asante, Tom McCaskey, spoke of the tumult in the African archive, that they are tumultuous. And David William Cohen recently commented that oral traditions never settle, they are ongoing pulsations. Interestingly, Anne-Laura Stoller and Elizabeth Edwards both use the language of pulse to open up the workings of the written archives and photographs, respectively. So something is at work in all of this that makes it live, meant here in the sense of the adjective, not the verb. Live as in a single vibration or sh short burst of sound, an electric current, light or other wave. In other words, it is alive or more accurately, it takes on other lives in its encounters with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia, for the incredible lecture. Um, uh, so I would like to open up the floor for questions and comments. And we ask you to uh, write in the chat uh, your name or if you have a question so that we can call on you um, and um, so that we can uh, keep track of who has questions. So please write in the chat if you have questions and we'll call your name so that you can ask your question or comment. I don't know if you can see also the chat, Patricia, but John Mason is writing. <laughs> so while we uh, wait for uh, questions from the audience, maybe I have uh, one question about methodology and we have been discussing this uh, in the past. 
um, which is how that your choice for this talk and for this project to focus, to zoom in and work starting from one image. So um, if you could discuss more that methodological choice and what it did and the experience of working with that. Thank you very much, Julia. I, you know, I um, have to say that um, I have amassed an enormous amount of material about this region and this period and working through it, trying to make, you know, uh, to make, to see what happens when you work with different kinds of historical media, if you like. Um, and, you know, the wonderful and the exasperating thing is that you find that once you start working with, uh, it could be this image, it could be that image, but they, they start to have a magnetic effect and they, they start attracting, um, you know, you, you kind of need to be digging around all the other archives in order to come in at them and try to start peeling back the layers of what they might be about. And it tends to really disrupt everything else. And I think that's one of the very interesting methodological issues um, that we experience when we work with photographs in relation to other archives. Um, so I, I must say, I never intended to spend so much time on this photograph, but it sucked me in like some kind of crime scene. Um, and the fact that it gets repeated, um, you know, it, it reminded me of, um, a, a phenomenon I noticed from the period of the anti-colonial war in Namibia where, um, you know, the Namibian nationalist organization had a guerrilla army that operated in the environment in um, very interesting ways um, and depended a lot on the rainy season for cover um, many of them came from this region that I'm talking about. And it was, you know, a massive effort by South Africa to try to quell this insurgency. Um, and there are memoirs by South African conscripts and um, permanent force members, where there's an absolute fascination with the figure of the the African soldier, because they hardly ever get to see them, especially close up uh, and alive. So I think that probably is what started me off on this on this trail. But um, so so what I also find very interesting, Julia, is that, and I'm not sure if it's the same for other people. You you might assemble one working method for one photograph, and then when you move on to another photograph, you find you have to read whole other different uh, texts and get suggestions from a whole bank of other places. And so it might not translate easily into other settings. So it's almost as if you need to devote um, very specific efforts around particular photographs. And I often think of them as very angular things because they come in at such an odd direction. Um, you know, the, the sort of that microscopic time, the sort of nanosecond, the micro temporality of it, it, it leads to such a dilation of, of other things that you need 
to bring to bear to try to understand. Um, and, you know, I think for most of us, for certainly myself for many years, uh, you know, one used to just gloss over photographic images um, and, you know, put them to service for arguments you had already developed from other materials. And so they were brought in to supplement that. And if you allow them to become unruly, I think it, it would be very interesting. And so, you know, I, I find that with this particular photograph and this album, that um, I might have planned a, a sequence of chronological chapters where I'm going to talk about Kwamatu in one chapter and the Kwanyama area in the next chapter and the problem with Mandume. But actually I need to borrow Mandume's ideas to go to the earlier period because they were generally held ideas and they don't just belong to him. So it's kind of created this turbulence that is um, very, very challenging and interesting to work with. And um, I'm, you know, I think this is part of the um, motivation for what we have uh, tried to plan in a very open and inviting way in our workshop tomorrow, uh, you know, where other scholars who might be having an exciting ride with particular photographs, um, that, that it's actually okay to come and talk about these issues. Um, and acknowledge that we don't have all the, um, we're not operating with certainties. You know, the, um, our language has to change. Our periodizations have to change. Delinda has a question. Hi, thank you, Patricia, I really, um... I so was vibing with with the way you read that photo and the photo itself and 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 what you're saying now and and bear with me I'm just kind of rolling through my thoughts about what you just said um, because I've been thinking a lot about um, the notion of evidence uh, mm -hmm. both in terms of the functions of photography what it was created to do and and its kind of technicality. Um, but then also how we use historical photographs now as evidence, just as you were saying, right, that um, that they point to something else or we have to sort of build mm -hmm. these textual and contextual um, uh, things around them to, to understand them. But I wonder, and so I'm just, again, this is not so much as a question as just thinking with you about um, the aspect of trauma that seems to be embedded in a lot of these photographs that you're looking at. And if that might be one of the things, you know, the affective things embedded in that photograph that we can't talk about um, because it's, it's uh, unspeakable in a way. And, and, um, and I think this will come up in, in what I want to talk about tomorrow mm -hmm. is um, the history of photography with psychoanalysis and also is kind of an evidentiary practice you know I don't know that's just <laughs> me rolling with it I don't know if, if you want to just comment on the notion of trauma embedded in photographs and and our role as scholars dealing with that mm -hmm. thanks very much Delinda um if I may ask you in turn when you talk about trauma, are you referring to, you know, histories of violence? Or are you speaking specifically of trauma that is, um, for instance, Ulrich Bayer in um, Spectral Evidence talks about the kind of the, uh, the stoppage, the paralysis, the non-movement that comes with trauma so that the psyche does not, is unable to process uh, violent experiences and, and he draws a parallel with, with the workings of uh, photography as well. Um, I'm, 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 can you just maybe 
elaborate yeah. a little bit there? Yeah, I think both maybe, because I'm thinking of, of the trauma of the photograph, the actual, you know, the freezing of time and, and um, kind of akin to what happens with, as you say, trauma that, that freezes you in time, but mm -hmm. also then how this extrapolates into a, a, an enormous social societal trauma that's been inflicted and how, you know, photography was used as a method of colonial violence, you know, mm -hmm. um, as you kind of really uh, pointed out in your talk that this was one of the technologies of war um, mm -hmm. and has been developed alongside of, of those um, arsenals. So, yeah, so maybe um, what I'm getting at is, is the relationship of that, that instantaneous trauma or the personal trauma of one actor um, or victim in that story and um and the larger societal things that we you know typically we're asked to do as historians is to account for those the big aspects the meta aspects um but but yet i feel in your talk you wanting to relate that back to an individual experience of that and to preserve that um you know, and, and to not so much give dignity to that suffering, but at least acknowledge that it's there and that you can't reach it in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, the last part of what you said, I uh, really resonates actually. Um, you know, the, of course, there's that freezing and there's the instantaneous, um, character, uh, uh, that that quality um, that that is 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 doing very specific things that that you know many of us have worked on so eloquently, at, in, including of course in your work. Um, but the interest, I think, what interests me here um, is that it might be instantaneous. Okay, the, 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 the taking of the photograph, the production of the image, however, it lasts. It, so I'm interested in the, the longevity of it. And in fact, I'm interested in what else might be there be other than trauma. I'm not sure if that makes sense. What, what is very... Um, I find very important um, is that there is so little that is um, generally known about this region and what happened in this area because it became such a backwater that it seems, um, you know, one feels impelled to go on a journey because these things have lasted. And they are, you know, what, what also is very interesting is the, the, the echoes around certain events that appear in other kinds of historical material, like, you know, the, the oral narratives. Um, so there's something about the way it lasts that, I think is really um, a big mover from from my point of view. Um, you know, I, I the nature of the defeat at Pembe, with over three hundred Portuguese soldiers were killed, is in fact really extraordinary. Um, anyway, I, you know, and and so how come we know about Adwa in Ethiopia, but we know very little about this, for example. Um, and, and, you know, what I'm, I'm very interested in the kind of conversations that can arise once you let these long lasting bits sort of float to the surface. And this is not to minimize by any means uh, the, the aspect of violence of which there is plenty more to say. Um, but there seems to be something possibly affirming in the fact that it's lasted and it can be interpreted in multiple different ways um, in the present. <laughs>
Thanks. Thank you. I actually, and please a reminder, if you have questions or comments, please write your name on the chat and we'll call your name. I think following on this conversation um, and exchange with Delinda, that made me think of actually Buki Gabajazin, who's in the audience article mm -hmm. and um, her writing on uh, the importance of focusing on, on the African experience of photography and the importance of doing that particularly because so much of the history of the medium in the continent has been dominated um, by uh, through colonialism, uh, by the Western gaze. And, um, and I think there is almost this kind of impossible weight and trauma that I think is almost, uh, it's there so but at the same time there is this this aspect that one needs to kind of maybe the challenge is also to try to find strategies so that mm -hmm. uh, an agency or a counter um, uh, or an oppositional gaze uh, is restored somehow and so here my question for uh, Patricia was wondering how much also this focus on disrupting time focusing trying to capture and consider the pre-photographic or the non-photographic is a strategy mm -hmm. to precisely uh, recapture an agency or an African experience of photography mm -hmm. or uh, of Africa history of light, as you write in ambivalent. Uh, <laughs> um, thanks, Julia. Um, I think that is so important. Um, and, you know, um, in the edited volume ambivalent, there's a really wonderful chapter by Isabel de Rezende, um about uh, Congo and early travelers. And um, I, I really wish Isabel, I, I, Isabel might be here. Isabel, you must publish your thesis. <laughs> it's so important. Um, and you know, Julia, it just occurred to me that maybe, maybe we are doing with photography some of the the work that has led some, we're producing the effects that have also led to the hardening of categories like colonial and pre-colonial. And I think the challenge for us is to try to work with the pre-photographic and the non-photographic and different definitions of image so that we could even talk about, you know, sonic images for, for instance, that would allow us to break down the, you know, the, um, the kind of reifications that might be happening around, especially colonial photography and photography itself. You know, are we turning photography into a sort of disciplinary movement? Um, and actually, maybe we need to make it much more porous around the edges, as you say, um, to allow for the sort of interpenetrations of these different African ideas of, of light. You know, I think that the argument about different temporalities is a really interesting one. And I think that, um, you know, is, didn't Roland Barthes have a phrase somewhere where he talked about the camera as a kind of visual clock. You know, maybe maybe that's a kind of area that we should be pushing. Uh, you know, I've put certain things on the table today, like I've uh, laid out some possibilities of the presence of this photo, the way that it might reference other concepts of time. But I really feel that much more work needs to be done, much more theorizing. Um, around what difference those African experiences and concepts of time could do to um, an artifact like that image. So I'm not really able to answer your question except to, um, you know, applaud what you're saying and um, how important it is to work around the edges of photography so that certain forms of photography like 
pr those produced um, that we find in colonial ar archives can be, in a sense, marginalized. Maybe I'll ask one last question, um, just to, um, if there aren't others, is uh, because you just mentioned archive, oh, actually, uh, Scott has a question. Scott, I'll, do you wanna mm -hmm. articulate your question? I'll read it for you if he's not, ah, sorry, he just wrote it to me. So Scott is, uh, uh, he's not able to speak on the mic. He says that Patricia, you quoted Krakauer saying that the photographic album is often considered a first draft of history. What does this mean for your, our role as historian, both in this particular research as you seek to dismantle periodization and in the work of historians, particularly photographic historians more generally, do you see yourself as an editor, a rewriter, a critic? Oh, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, most intriguing question. Um, the I, first of all, the it's not the photo album that would be the first draft of history. That that's um, I was citing Krakauer, who's actually talking about the photograph, and this statement about the first draft of history has always intrigued me, and I. I'm not sure that one can fully answer this because it keeps yielding new things, actually. Um, I think the notion of a first draft is really fantastic because it's letting everything in. And I certainly, uh, and I think what I've, the difficulties I've described about the unruliness of a photographic image you find yourself working with is, it comes down to its first draftness. It's, it's let everything in, it's, and I certainly don't want to be an editor, but I probably have ended up editing and, and crafting it and interpreting it into certain forms of narrative because I'm one of those very, problematic people, the historian who works with the double operation, which is uh, that we think we can reconstruct, actually reconstruct. Um, so by acknowledging that, I just want to say how uh, rich and generative this formulation by Krakauer is and, and has, always, um, has always been for me, actually. Um, and, you know, it, it comes back to that point that I forget who said this, but the photograph comes, comes to you like something between a dream and a document. And I think that first draftness point actually uh, speaks to that very well. Thank you. Wonderful. So I'm gonna, since this is like a wonderful point, I think we're gonna uh, conclude here. Uh, again, join me in thanking Patricia for the wonderful uh, talk. And uh, we have all, I think, so much to think about and digest. So um, we look forward to read uh, what comes out of this talk, hopefully soon. And thank you everybody uh, for uh, coming and joining in from everywhere around the world. Thank you all. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Julia.